Welcome to John Muir Land Trust's Twilight 2020 Meet a Barn Owl with Lindsay Wildlife Experience. This is our first event of Twilight 2020. Thank you all for attending. We have 120 people online here and the presenters feel blessed to be a part of this community. And so thank you so much for joining us today. We wish you all well-being and health. A little bit about the John Muir Land Trust before we get started. Our mission is to protect and care for open space, ranches, farms, parkland, and shoreline in the East Bay. We define the East Bay as Contra Costa and Alameda counties. This is our service area. You can see the dark orange properties that we have preserved. And with more than 3,500 acres and 17 properties now under stewardship, many of the most beautiful places in the East Bay are permanently preserved for recreation, wildlife, and scenic views, like this one here. So please visit jmlt.org to learn more about visiting our properties today. And I recommend that you do. So as a part of John Muir Land Trust's vision, we foster environmental awareness. You may have joined us at Twilight at Fernandez Ranch in years past to meet wildlife, gaze at the stars, and learn about what happens in the East Bay Hills when the sun goes down. This is a photo of Lindsay Wildlife Experience's animal ambassadors, who we met at Twilight last year at Fernandez Ranch. We have a red-tailed hawk and a great horned owl here, and in a few moments you will hear more about the animal ambassadors from Métis. We encourage you to visit Fernandez Ranch today or this weekend. You will find 1,185 spectacular acres for hiking. And it is, it is open from sunrise to sunset, located just off of Highway 4. If you visit Fernandez Ranch, keep your eyes open for Western bluebirds who are often spotted there. Thanks to one of our volunteer photographers for capturing this photo for us on one of her hikes. And before we meet even more feathered friends, we'd like to hear from you about the types of bird evidence or kinds of birds you have seen recently. You might have been keeping a bird journal for this event. So please share with us in the chat what you have seen. And now I'd like to hand over the presentation to Maiti. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Hannah, and welcome once again, everyone. Uh, my name is Maiti. I am the Youth Programs Coordinator at Lindsay Wildlife Experience, and I'm very happy to be your presenters for today. We're going to be talking about twilight birds, owls in particular. Now, as many of you know, uh, Lindsay Wildlife Experience is currently closed to the public. Uh, if you have visited us before in the past, that is excellent, but if you have not, I sincerely hope that you'll uh, check us out and visit us when we do open up again, hopefully in the near future. Okay, so we'll go ahead and jump right in. The mission of Lindsay Wildlife is to connect people with wildlife to inspire responsibility and respect for the world that we share. And we do that in every single thing and every single program that we offer. Of course, most folks uh, know us through our wildlife hospital where we treat thousands and thousands of patients annually. We have our exhibit hall, our education center, where you can see our live animal ambassadors. And the lesser known part of Lindsay, but perhaps the, the original Lindsay, is our Natural History Museum. All right, so a little bit about the history of Lindsay Wildlife Experience as an institution. We got our start all the way back in 1955, of course, by Alexander Lindsay himself. Uh, so that's quite a long time ago. We started out as a small natural history museum um, called uh, the Alexander Lindsay Jr. Museum, and our names have changed to the Lindsay Wildlife Museum and currently Lindsay Wildlife Experience. But we have always been a volunteer-based nonprofit institution. Our Wildlife Rehabilitation Hospital, again, it is uh, one of the, uh, it's the part of Lindsay that most folks recognize. Uh, it, the hospital itself got its start back in 1970, and at the time it is, it was the very first institution in the country, the first wildlife rehabilitation hospital in the country uh, to do the work that we do. 
And at our current capacity, we have, uh, we were able to treat up to, uh, anywhere between five to 6,000 patients annually. And as I mentioned before, we are three facilities under one roof, uh, an education center, wildlife rehabilitation hospital, and the natural history museum. And a quick note here as well, uh, even though our museum and our education center might be current, might be close to the public, our wildlife hospital is still open and operating and we are still accepting animals and treating them every single day. So let's move right along to the Lindsay Wildlife Live Collection. This is the, the collective name for the over 70 live animal ambassadors that call Lindsay Wildlife their home. We have all manners of animals from birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. And we have a couple of pictures right here. Of course, we have uh, Penelope, our porcupine, uh, playing with her plastic ball right on the corner. We have Apollo, our California king snake. Right down in the bottom center is Lord Richard. He's one of our original animal ambassadors and currently the, sing the, the oldest living turkey vulture in the world at, uh, I believe, 44 years old, if I remember the age correctly. Uh, so all of those animals represent more than 40 different species, and all of them have their own story of why they are at Lindsay Wildlife. Uh, they either have an uh, injury or a disability that does not allow them to survive in the wild. Okay, but we're here to talk about birds, so we'll go ahead and talk about uh, briefly about some of the common East Bay birds that you may have found. Uh, I'm, um, look, I saw through the chat, there are excellent variety of birds that, uh, that people have seen before. The Bay Area is definitely one of the birding hotspots, um, especially in Point Reyes uh, Nas National Seashore. It is certainly one of the best places to see uh, migratory birds, especially if you are into birds of prey. Uh, but these are some of the common birds that, uh, that call Lindsay their home and ones that you might find in, uh, in our area as well. We have the acorn woodpecker that you might uh, hear in the oak woodlands and the open spaces around the Bay Area. They are known for their eh, 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 sound that they like to make. And you don't just find one, they like to live in larger family groups. Uh, so you might find several in, uh, in one time. You never see just one acorn woodpecker, I always like to say. Um, or, uh, at the bottom, we have the American kestrel, the smallest falcon that lives in North America. We, uh, we have quite a, a large number of them that live in the Bay Area. They can be easily mistaken for smaller birds because they are really not that big. Uh, the band-tailed pigeon, that is a native pigeon, uh, so that they tend to live in the woodlands, uh, though they are not the same type of pigeons you see running around or flying around in the cities. The red-shouldered hawk, of course, with their nice black and white bands on their tails, you might see that in your own neighborhood. And at front and center is the white-tailed kite, uh, one of my favorite birds, actually, because they actually do hover when they're looking for food in larger fields. And you can find them around here in the Bay Area as well. We'll move right along to talking about the twilight creatures, creatures of the dawn and dusk. Now, of course, when people think of what animals are out during the dawn and dusk hours, you might think of owls. And these are three of the common owl species that we have here. Well, the first one, the barn owl, single most common owl species that we have in the Bay Area. And they are found throughout much of the world as well. The great horned owl, as well with their, their two plumy corns. That's the name for their ear-like structure that's on their, right on their head. And right at the bottom is a little bit of a sheet because that is a great gray owl. You don't find them in the Bay Area, but they are found around the Yosemite National Park area. But I always like to include them because they are in California and they are actually the tallest owl species in the world if you measure them by the top of their head down to the tip of their tail. But they might be big, but all you're seeing is really feathers. There's not a whole lot of owl underneath all that feather. So there is a specific term that refers to an animal that is most active during the twilight hours, during the dawn and dusk. And I was wondering, 
Does anyone know what that term is? It's going to be a quick poll that comes up. I'm curious to hear if you might know what that term is. There we go. We have four choices here. Now, owls are indeed uh, nighttime creatures, but they are certainly, um, they, they are, uh, they can be active during the day sometimes, but they are most active during the dawn and dusk hours. All right. Let's see here. So ma many folks say nocturnal, which is technically correct. But the term that refers to the species that are active during the dawn and dusk hours are crepuscular. That's quite a mouthful, I think, but I, uh, that's one of my, my favorite words because I think it's just fun to say. But a crepuscular creature are uh, critters that are most active during the dawn and dusk hours. And you can just need, you just need to uh, imagine a little bit uh, what time do you normally hear birds singing? What time do you typically see animals out and about the most? It's typically going to be the dawn and dusk hours because there's still a little bit of light in the sky, uh, but it's not nearly as hot as say during the, uh, the middle of the day. But today we are going to be focusing primarily on the barn owls. There you go. So it's going to be another poll up. I am very curious to hear if you have personally encountered a barn owl before. This is always a fun question. I always like to ask folks in my program because they are quite common. They are around in many places in the Bay Area and much of the world. Let's see. Yes, most folks have seen or encountered a barn owl before. And chances are, if you don't, uh, if, if you're not sure, chances are you may have heard them before. And that leads me to the second question. What sound do you think a barn owl makes? This is another one of my favorite questions to ask um, folks at the museum. First, when most people think of owls, they might think of a particular sound that they make. Let's see here. Oh, wow, that's awesome. You all know your barn owls. They do make this screeching sound how barn owls do not, uh, they don't have the, uh, the ability to make your typical hoot hoot sound uh, that, you, uh, that you might associate with many other owls. They do, they screech, they hiss, and they might make little uh, raspy twittering sound that might remind you of a car alarm. Um, at, at least the, owl, uh, the barn owls at Lindsay Wildlife, one of them, uh, he does have, the, uh, does have the tendency to do that. So they have that screeching sound, really raspy sound. And as I mentioned before, they are the species of owl that, uh, that are quite common and you might find them in your neighborhoods, especially if there are open fields nearby. And if, you're, if your neighborhood have lots of palm trees, for, for example, they do have the tendency to nest on the top of palm trees as well. Now I can't tell you why they go for palm trees, but that seems to be something that they, uh, that they do. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to the first barn owl uh, that we have at Lindsay Wildlife. And the, the video is going to be presented by our wonderful animal keeper, Mandy. So we'll go ahead and learn a little bit more about the barn owl for Mandy. For Mandy. Hi, my name is Mandy and I'm an animal keeper here at Lindsay Wildlife Experience and today we're going to introduce you to our male barn owl, Tito. Meet Tito, a 16-year-old barn owl that calls Lindsay Wildlife Experience home. Barn owls can be found in a variety of open habitats ranging from grasslands to deserts. They are primarily nocturnal, hunting at night. 
and will use their excellent eyesight and hearing to locate their prey, which generally consists of small mammals such as rats and mice. Once a barn owl catches its prey, it will either rip it into pieces with its sharp beak and talons or swallow it whole. Once swallowed, the owl will digest the soft tissue and internal organs of the animal. However, it cannot digest the fur, teeth, or bones. The fur and bones get compacted into the gizzard of the owl and are eventually regurgitated into what is known as an owl pellet. To catch their prey, barn owls rely on their nearly silent flight. Their feathers are serrated on the leading edge of their wing, which helps to reduce noise. They also have large wings, and feathers that extend all the way down to the tips of their toes. These feathers help to reduce the noise of their flight. Although you may not be able to hear a barn owl fly, you can listen for some of the many vocalizations that they make. Here we have recorded some of Taito's vocalizations. <laughs> When Taito isn't outside in our Redwood Grove or in our exhibit hall, he spends time behind the scenes in one of our many open aviaries. This gives him the opportunity to relax and rest during the daytime. Taito was brought to the Lindsay Wildlife Experience Hospital in 2004 with a fracture in his left wing. Unfortunately, Taito's fracture did not heal well enough for him to be returned to the wild, and he has been part of the Lindsay Wildlife Experience Animal Ambassador Collection ever since. We hope you enjoyed meeting Taito today and encourage you to tune in to our next Keeper feature. Awesome. So that right there is Taito. He is our male barn owl. And in just a moment, you will be able to see and meet one of our uh, other barn owls, well, a female. Uh, but seeing this barn owl up close is really a special uh, opportunity because you get to see all of, the, uh, all of their bodily features they're tools of the trade, I like to call them, because they, uh, they are highly adapted and they are really, really good at what they do. Uh, they do have good eyesight, but better, uh, better than their eyesight is their sense of hearing, their hearing. Now, they have their very special ear uh, and, their, and the way that they use to focus those sound is actually through their face. That's one of, the, one of the favorite things that I like to talk about barn owls as well as their ability to hear and how they listen for and, and, and find their food in the, uh, in the darkest night. They don't have the ear lobes like we do because that is not very, not very aerodynamic, but their ears are right where you expect them to be, just on the side of their head, but they are lopsided. They are actually um, they are asymmetrical, and that actually helps them triangulate sound uh, at night or really any other time of day to find exactly, to pinpoint where their food is. And the heart-shaped face, the disc that they have around their face, is called their facial disc. Most owls have this, but I think it is most prominent in these guys, in the, in the barn owls. And their whole face acts a lot like a radar dish. That's their ear, their whole face is their ear that they use to channel sound right into their ear canals. And their sense of hearing is actually so good that they require no light at all. And I have read some statistics that have um, that pinpointed down to about uh, up to 90% success rate that they hear any mice or rodents skittering on the ground, they can pinpoint it down and hunt them without any assistance at all. And that is aided by their silent flight. If you look at Taito here, you might, uh, you might think to yourself why those feathers look quite soft, and they are. Owl, owl feathers are extremely soft, and that help dampen sound. Uh, they are a little different from a hawk's feather or an eagle's feather, where the, they don't need to be very quiet. They're out during the day. Any, uh, any other critter can see them, so they just need to be fast. So their feathers, the hawk and eagle feathers, are actually stronger, they are stiffer, and they make more sound. But owls, uh, owls feather, they are softer, they dampen sound, but as a result, they're also not as strong. So they can fly very silently, they can triangulate where exactly where their rodent meal is, and they use their very strong, very sharp talons to go down and grab their, uh, their rodent food. 
And that is exactly what they eat. All manners of rodents, uh, they will occasionally, uh, occasionally grab uh, insects and, and, uh, and amphibians as well, but those are a very, very small minority uh, of their food. Uh, most of it is going to be rodents. And that is actually why most farmers enjoy having barn owls in their area because they take care of gophers and other rodent for them. So I do have a quick little activity, activity for you to help you visualize and illustrate how their whole face acts as, they, uh, as their ear, essentially. Now this works best if you're not wearing a headphone, uh, but if you'd like to follow along, if you want to put your hand behind your ears like so and focus on wherever sound is coming from. Uh, it could be from your computer. As I mentioned, if you're wearing headphones, this doesn't work as well, but this helps illustrate how their whole face works to help channel sound into their ears. When you put your hands behind your ear, you're increasing the surface area of your ear and there's more spaces for sound to be captured and directed into your ear. And that's essentially how their whole face works, which I think is really cool. All right, so now that we, uh, we learn a little bit more about the owls themselves, uh, about their tools of the trade and how they do, we're going to go ahead and watch a second video that showcased our female barn owl, Alba. There we go. So you, uh, so right there, you're able to see their features up really, really closely. Uh, their sharp, large feet and talons. That is actually quite large for their size. And what you're seeing here again is not a whole lot of owl. They're mostly feathers. Uh, the the actual owl body itself. There's not a whole lot underneath those feathers and. Um, Barn owls typically weigh anywhere between um, uh, a little, just a little over a pound in most cases. But you're able to see the little small round feathers that make up the edge of their facial disc. Those are specialized feather right in their face that does a good job of directing sound right into their ears, which is underneath all of those feathers. Now to the more perceptive of you might uh, recognize that the male and female barn owl are a little different. The male, Taito, it has a bright white body. And the female barn owls have this nice shade of gold with black speckles on them. Uh, that is what we call sexual dimorphism. There's slight differences between the two and you can actually, uh, that makes it really easy to tell uh, male from female, which is a good trait if you're studying barn owls. It makes your job much easier. Uh, but if you're studying any other species of bird or owls, uh, as a lot of our birder friends uh, will attest to, it can be quite hard to tell apart males and female, especially if there's not a lot of difference between the two. And their sizes, there's not, uh, their sizes are very similar as well, uh, but looking at the color, coloration on their, on their chest and body, you can tell the gender of the owl. Now, for all of our birder friends, you might have recognized that already, the male Taito, the female Alba, that is incidentally a, uh, the scientific name for barn owls, Taito Alba. I always like to say that we're very creative with our names. We, may, uh, we, um, we just choose the name that makes sense to them. Now Alba here, she, ha uh, she came into us back in 1999, which already makes her 21 years old. And I saw that there was a question earlier about uh, the average age um, that barn owls can live to. They have an average lifespan in the wild of only anywhere between one to three years at the most. They, so being 21 is exceptional for a barn owl. 
And that gives you an idea of the differences that could show up between their potential age that they can live to, to their actual, uh, their, their actual life, lifespan in the, uh, in the wild. There's a lot of stresses. Uh, the stresses of having to survive every single day uh, is, uh, it puts a lot of stress on, on their body and that tends to push down their lifespan quite a bit. And because barn owls are, uh, they are very lightly built, they're really, really good at what they do, hunting rodents. They're not really good at, mu uh, at a whole lot of other things. And as a result, uh, they do fall prey to larger owls, like the great horned owls, for example. Uh, occasionally, great horned owls will, cha uh, will chase down, and if they can, will catch and, and prey on barn owls as well. And of course, hawks, uh, they, uh, they don't have that ability to actually fight back and, uh, aside from flying away. And Taito, the male is 16 years old, so they're both quite old, um, but they are both doing well, and we're happy to have them with us at Lindsay Wildlife Experience. A uh, follow-up question on there. Uh, great horned owls are quite common in the Bay Area as well. Um, they, uh, I don't know the actual, actual percentage, but they are quite, uh, they, they are quite common. Uh, and where you see great horned owls, you're typically not going to find uh, barn owls in that area because great horned owls, they're nicknamed the tigers of the sky, and they do have the, uh, they do have a tendency to chase away any other owls they see in that, in that area. Hey, Mei Chi. Um, I'm just going to ask you something. I've, I've been looking through the Q and A's and want to help you yeah. along. Well, um, can, I saw some questions about the barn owls clicking. Um, do we know? Yes. A common thing for them. Yeah, they do make that clicking sound. Uh, in fact, most owls uh, they do make their clicking sound. They you that uh, they do that by clacking their beaks together. Uh, so and they make that very audible clicking sound. Uh, and that tends to be a display of uh, displeasure, I always like to say. Um, I, I, know most, uh, I know about the behaviors of the owls that live with us at Lindsay Wildlife, and they will clack at us when they're, uh, when they're not happy about something. Um, in the wild, that could be a territorial um, uh, display. It can be a, a threat display as well. Great, thank you. There's also a question about a barn owl box. I know a lot of people are interested in building yes. those in the backyard. What, what, where's um, maybe a good place to put one? Yeah, definitely. So that's actually the next point that I was about to, uh, to talk about as well. Uh, these owls are, uh, because they are very common and they are very beneficial to us as well, especially in an agricultural area uh, that surrounds the Bay Area. Uh, they prey on a lot of potential pest rodents. So a lot of farmers do like to have them around in their fields and a lot of folks in their backyard as well. They do take gophers and hunt them uh, very efficiently. Uh, there is a nonprofit that deals specifically with um, with barn owl boxes and helping uh, and, and helping them thrive in our area, the uh, the Hungry Owl Project is a great uh, is a nonprofit and is a great place to uh, to look for more information about that. Uh, but generally, barn owl boxes they are a very common type of um, of bird boxes that can be a, a family project and put up in your in your own property. Uh, Corner Lab of Ornithology also has their nest watch program, and they do have a plan that's already that's ready to print uh, that guides you how to build and where to place those uh, those boxes. So that um, yeah, so that, that that's the resources that I would direct you to. Gee, I was going to ask one more. Um, people are asking about the different sounds of owls, and especially the hoo hoo sound, which we all know. I'm very familiar with. How many of those owls make that sound? Uh, to my knowledge, most owls, uh, it, uh, the, the screeching, the hissing sound is definitely uh, an exception, I, I would say, uh, to most owl species. Uh, they do make, uh, most owls do make that uh, different variations of hooting sound. It could be louder, softer, but just different variations of the hooting sound. Great. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, and once again, uh, Hungry Owl Project is a great place to look at if you're interested in building owl boxes and placing them in your area. The Corno Lava Ornithology Nest Watch Program is also a great resource as well. 
And that, uh, again, it is a very common, uh, it, it is it, something that has been growing, a growing movement in the Bay Area to put up barn owl boxes in especially organic farms and vineyards up north uh, so that uh, less rodenticide is used in, um, in the fields or for organic farms as well. They are definitely a very unique species that's really, really good at what they do. And it is our responsibility to help uh, protect them because barn owls, are, they're, they are doing quite well in California, but in other parts of our country, especially in, um, in the Northeast, I believe, if I remember my information correctly, they are slowly declining in some places. And that is primarily due to, uh, due to rodenticide poisoning. As um, these chemicals are placed in fields and farms, it does move up the food chain. And a lot of folks don't realize that rodenticide don't actually dispatch the rodents right away. It might take a while for them to actually die. And in that time, the owls might fly around and they might see a slower moving rodent. They will catch them and they'll eat them. And in fact, in our very own wildlife hospital, they, uh, we do see barn owls with evidence of these chemicals, uh, chemicals rodenticide in their system quite often as well. Uh, so that's something that I would recommend is to avoid using uh, rodenticide and opt for a more natural way of getting rid of pests and rodents if you have them in your natural area and avoid using nettings as well. Garden nettings can harm uh, not just barn owls, but, uh, but reptiles as well. So just by making little changes like that in your everyday life, in your own gardens, in your own homes, it can go a long way in helping our, uh, the habitats and the areas around our, uh, around our house, around our community, healthier for both us and for the wildlife that share the landscape with, that we share the landscape with as well. Very good. So that, so I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about barn owls today. I hope you learned something new and I would be happy to take any questions, uh, any other questions that you might have. I want to thank you very much for your time. There's still some um, additional questions here. We can go yes, through. Yes, of course. Uh, let's see here. The best area to view uh, sitting eagles or hawks around here? Maybe where to photograph some of these wonderful birds? Yeah, for uh, for golden eagle is, uh, is something that, uh, that pops up into my mind right away. Uh, in fact, uh, the areas, uh, Mount Diablo and the area surrounding the mountain uh, is actually one, uh, it, those area has the highest concentration of, uh, of golden eagles and found anywhere in the world, which is a very unique, uh, unique thing uh, to have right here in our area. Now they do fly very high and they have a very large uh, territory size. So you might have a harder time viewing them, but Mount Diablo is a great place uh, to, uh, to post yourself somewhere and try to see if you can find golden eagles. Uh, in the meantime, you can see lots and lots of turkey vultures. You can see lots of red-tailed hawks around Mount Diablo areas as well. And uh, for bald eagles, uh, you're going to find them closer to bodies of water um, around the bay, especially as you get closer to the, to the coast, you might be able to find them. Great. Thank you. And I know we see, I know I do, I see a lot of bats in the twilight hours. Ah, I'm wondering, yes. do, bird, do the owls kind of prey on those? And there's so many I know around. Yeah, here. definitely they do, um, but it's more opportunistic. Uh, if they happen to find themselves in the path of a, a, of a bat swarm, for example, then they might go ahead and catch one and eat them. Uh, but I, Bats are small and they are quite agile and it, uh, it doesn't provide a lot of nutrition for, uh, for the amount of work that goes into actually uh, try to chase them and catch them. But I, I have seen, uh, seen a few uh, eating bats before. Great. And um, someone else was asking about just the, the owls when they vocalize. Is there a, a time when they're not as kind of loud and, or are they consistently... Yeah. Definitely. So hooting uh, owls, uh, as a general rule of thumb, uh, when uh, any birds, when they vocalize, it typically means that they are uh, trying to find a mate. Uh, they are 
trying to chase away something as a threat display or a territorial display. So those are going to be um, the primary reason why they make, uh, they, they, they sing or they make any vocalization. So what that means for an owl uh, is uh, unless they are threatened or they are actively trying to find a mate, they are going to stay nice and quiet. And that, uh, that plays into their, uh, into their favor as well. They don't want to give their location away when they're hunting at night, for example. That makes sense. Um, we also have a question about just someone's res residential garden. Uh, is there a way mm -hmm. to, to bring kind of owls to that, a way to su support the barn owls with what you have in your garden? You can. Now that, that's a, a, a little bit tricky because the main reason why a barn owl wants to live in a particular area is because there's a lot of rodents around. And that might not, want, that might not be something that you have in your, in your residential garden, um, but I know that um, barn owls can, I, I've seen them in the middle of the suburban areas before, right on top of, uh, of palm trees, for example. So they can find uh, food and rodents in those areas. Um, they might be common, and when uh, when you put up barn owl boxes, is not a guarantee that that you will get um, there. There's no way to guarantee that you will be able to get barn owls uh, to use that box. Um, but as long as the area is nice and healthy, free of rodenticide, and has a relatively healthy rodent population, there's a good chance that uh, that the barn owls might decide to make it their home. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, also, someone had asked about <clears throat> snowy, snowy owls. Are those around? Oh, yep. Oh, okay. Uh, snowy owls, they, uh, they do not breed in California, uh, but there may be a few that just ends up here uh, just because they, uh, they, they lost their way or uh, they took the uh, wrong turn somewhere and they might just end up here in California. Um, snowy owls are very interesting because they're quite large. Uh, they're very, uh, very iconic. Uh, but they live uh, primarily in the northern states and then uh, into Canada. Um, but that, but they will occasionally go um, beyond that space, uh, beyond that range. Uh, occasionally, I know that uh, in uh, the uh, airport, the Honolulu International Airport in Hawaii, they do get snowy owls there every couple of years. The one just end up there uh, for no particular reason. Uh, but of course, like they um, they they just show up one at a time, so there there's no chance of them actually uh, establishing a population. Um, but that that does happen on occasion. Same thing with peregrine falcon as well. They I know that one nest in the island of Kauai, uh, but just one pair. Um, so you have these different types of birds that will occasionally take the wrong detour somewhere, and they'll end up in a place where they are typically not supposed to be. Great. Thank you for that. Of um, yeah, we have a few others. Let me just see if we've, um, there's one here about, I hope, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Swainson's Hawks. Oh, Swainson's, yeah. Are those in our area? They are, yeah. Swainson's Hawk, they are one of my favorite hawk species because I think they are, that they, everything about them, they, uh, about their biology and their natural history are uh, just wild, I think. Uh, they do breed in our area only during the summer. Mm. They, uh, Swainson's hawk are a highly migratory and uh, I believe they are one of the most, um, they, they have some of the, uh, the longest migration route of any hawk species in the world. Um, they nest right here in, um, in most of the United States and certainly right here in California. But every winter, they fly all the way down to Argentina and they spend their, they spend their winters there and then they come back up here. So they make that round trip flight every single year. Well, that's great. That's good to know. <laughs> um, going back a little bit to the screech owl, mm -hmm. box, someone was asking if they should be in the shade or sun or ground. I wasn't sure if you had that answered that question. Oh, is this a, uh, the screech owl or the barn owl? The screech owl. Ah, the screech owls. Yeah, screech owls, they, they are, uh, we have one at Lindsay Wildlife as well. They, um, they, they are really cute. They're really tiny. Um, and they, uh, typically they, um, you don't want to put owl, barn, uh, owl boxes, any owl boxes on the ground or close to the ground. It needs to be higher up in the middle of the tree. Um, that my general rule of thumb is beyond, 
um, a uh, beyond a human's reach, uh, definitely up higher than that uh, would be uh, would be a good good height in the tree. Oh, great! Thank you. Um, let's see, we have another one here. Oh, someone asked if you could talk a little bit about the burrowing owl. Yes, yeah, definitely. Burrowing owls, I think they're, the, uh, I believe they're the most emotive of all of the owl species out there. Uh, they're not very good flyers. Uh, they, they do burrow, uh, they do dig on occasion, but they're not very good diggers, but they will repurpose, use gopher burrows typically uh, to, and, and make them their home. Uh, we have them, uh, we have them around, um, I believe that there's some places in Berkeley where you can see them. Uh, there's a lot of them out in the Central Valley and in, uh, in the open fields on occasion. So, and um, yeah, they, they're just really cool owls and they have a very unique adaptation in the fact that they are, they will favor running rather than flying. They're actually not very good flyers. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, for the great horned owls, um, I know we see a lot of those black ravens in our backyards flying around. And yeah. someone was curious if they chase away great horned owls from nests. Do they kind of go after them? Yeah, the, the crows and ravens, because uh, they by themselves, they don't pose too much of a threat. But uh, the, the, main, uh, the main strategy for for crows and ravens is they are, uh, they are extremely intelligent uh, and they are extremely social. So they gather in very large group and in a large enough group, they can chase away anything, including eagles. And they, you will see them harass hawks on a regular basis, especially if there's a group of more than five. Okay, great. Uh, we have a lot of great questions here. Um, I have a couple yeah. more. Um, of course, of course. <laughs> Do owls typically migrate or are they in the Bay Area year round? Yeah, uh, they're, uh, they're, hmm, rewind a little bit. Uh, there's all, all these answers coming to my head. Owls, that uh, some owls can't, uh, they do migrate. Some owls do migrate, uh, but not very far. California is a very interesting state in many respects. Uh, but one of the reason why people enjoy living in the Bay Area, the mild weather year round, actually cause some bird species to not migrate at all. Whereas if they live in other parts of the country, they'll migrate large distances. Um, the, uh, I, can't, I, I can't think of the top of my head which owl species regularly migrate, uh, but the, uh, the example that comes to me right now is uh, when you look at Canada geese and Aleutian cackling geese in particular, um, as their name suggests, they move up north and up to northern Canada and in Alaska uh, every single year to breed. Now, there's a growing population of them that lives in northern California that no longer migrates. They just live here year round because there's food here year round. And why fly all the way up to Alaska in the summer if you don't have to? That's great. And yeah. um, also another one for uh, barn owls, just talking about their, their babies and how many eggs mm -hmm. they have or how many. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, barn owls are also quite unique in that respect. Most owls uh, will only lay a, a limited number of eggs, anywhere between two and four, potentially up to five. Um, but barn owls can lay more than that, um, six, seven, perhaps and they don't hatch all at once. They, one will hatch, they'll grow a little bit, and another one will hatch, and they'll grow a little bit. So if you were to look up pictures of barn owl uh, nesting family, for example, you'll see uh, babies of all ages, one that are just having um, just downy, fluffy feathers to ones that are, that are larger, more adolescent. Uh, and that's all because uh, barn owls, they don't have a very high survival rate. So by having more, by laying more eggs, um, by, having, uh, by having more young, they are hedging their bets in a way so that hopefully out of all of those eggs that they lay, maybe one or two will survive until adulthood. Oh, great. Again, That's what I... Yeah. Yeah. Um, a few more. Uh, how can you tell the difference between a Swainson's and a red tail from underneath? From underneath, um, the, the, the first answer that comes to me is that if you see enough of them, then you will be able to pick out the difference. 
Uh, but Swings and Hawk, they are a little bit more nondescript in a way. Uh, the way I tell them apart, um, again, the disclaimer that I'm a songbird person, not really a, a, a hawk person, so I don't, um, uh, so Sharpshin's hawk and Cooper's hawk are still a very challenging uh, thing for me to tell apart. Uh, but the way I like to tell, uh, to tell apart the Swinson's hawk is if they have a nice white patch on their chin, not all Swainson's hawk will have that. Uh, but if they do have that, that's, uh, that's one thing that I look for. And of course, uh, if you can find the bright red tail, uh, the Rufus colored tail, then that will, tell, uh, that will give you a red tailed hawk. Uh, it's more about what, they, what char characteristics they don't have rather than what they have. Um, that's the way that I used to tell. So if they don't have a black and white band on their tail, well, that's, that's not a red shouldered hawk. It doesn't have a red tail, so it's not a red tailed hawk and could potentially be a Swainson's hawk at that point. Right, thank you so much for that. So mm -hmm. Let's see if we have a couple more. Someone, so someone um, heard barn owls kind of calling back and forth and they're wondering what, what does that mean? Are they looking for a mate? Is this sort of a territorial call? Yeah, it could be a combination. Right now we are, uh, we're out of the primary breeding season for our barn owls already, uh, but they can and, and will breed throughout the year if the conditions are right. Uh, but in California, the main breeding season for them is going to be earlier on in the year where it is, it's not as hot out uh, during the day. Um, so by them calling back and forth, it can be a territorial dispute. Um, say, hey, this is my patch of rodent grass, not yours. Um, that, uh, I, I think that is the, uh, the most likely explanation uh, during this time of year. Earlier on in the year, they could be calling out to find me. That's great. Thank you for that. And also, um, in terms of catching rodents, are, are they just going after the rodent in your backyard from the tree they're from, or are they going traveling big distances or do they kind of come back to their same spot every night? How does that work? Yeah, so they, uh, they will establish their territory and they will, uh, they will to a certain extent try to defend that space from other barn owls. And they will just go ahead and try to listen to where, uh, where the rodents are and, and zero in. So they, they might have their favorite hunting ground and they may come back to the same nest box every single year, assuming it's still safe for them to do so, um, but they are not tied down to a particular uh, spot per se. Okay, that's great. Um, I'll just ask a few more. I know we're getting close yeah. to the 10 o'clock hour. Um, I love questions. <laughs> I know, and you, you know every, all of it, so this is great. Owls, who, who's their greatest predator? The barn owl's uh, biggest predator? So yeah. in, in our area, uh, they, uh, cars and humans are their biggest predator, unfortunately, in, uh, in this area. Um, they with the rodenticide poisoning and net, uh, net, uh, garden netting and occasionally glue, uh, sticky glue traps uh, can be an issue for these barn owls as well. Uh, because uh, at night, especially, uh, they, might, they might hit into, uh, they, they might um, get hit by cars on occasion because uh, when they're really focused on rodents, for example, they, that they don't really pay attention to what's around them. Um, great horned owls are going to be another big predator for, for them, uh, but that's more uh, opportunistic than anything else. Uh, great horned owls don't typically fly around to, uh, and, and hunt down barn owls. If they happen to be in their territory, then uh, it, they might prey on them. Okay. That's great. Um, and just a couple more. First, um, barn owls, how do they get water? Are they coming into our backyard through the bird feeders or <laughs> water fountains? Yeah, so that actually they get most of their water requirements met just through the food that they eat, typically. So the, all the rodents that they eat, they swallow it whole and they get all the moisture that they need from, um, from just the food that they eat. Uh, rarely, if the weather gets too hot and we have a heat wave, then they may, uh, they, they may seek out uh, um, uh, bird, uh, bird baths or fountains, for example. Uh, but that's not, um, that's not common, typically. Okay, great. And um, someone had a question just about the Lindsay Wildlife Museum and yeah. 
have regular presentations that maybe a four or six year old can sit in on and learn more about the animals? Yeah, so right now we are slowly introducing outdoor programming uh, at Lindsay Wildlife, and that is currently uh, available on our website. On um, you know, it is uh, on, available for uh, for You need to reserve your spot, and since we are limiting the number of folks in programs, but we are slowly introducing that. And uh, we have uh, online um, online workshops that that should be up very soon. Uh, and there's a combination of workshops. Uh, there are some that are um, uh, that are targeted specifically for uh, for young kids, a kindergarten up to a certain grade level, third grade to fifth grade, for example. So we are introducing that program, and more will be coming in the, in, in the near future. Great. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, I know we're kind of at the end of the hour and there were a couple more questions, but I, I want to turn it over to Hannah because I think um, we can refer people to ask questions after this webinar as well. Yep. Definitely. Thank you so much, Maiti, for bringing us your barn owls. It's, it's been phenomenal to hear all these questions. And thank you to the audience for asking so many great questions. We've got a lot of excited people here. Thank you, Maiti. Yes, it has been great, um, great presentation. Thank you very much for all the excellent questions. Yes. Oh, we were getting an A plus in the chat here. That's phenomenal. Oh, thank you. Yes, well, thank you again, Métis, and also thank you to the Lindsay Wildlife Experience for being a phenomenal partner. We've been happy to have Lindsay Wildlife Experience come out to the um, actual Twilight at Fernandez Ranch and now Twilight 2020 here, um, here today. So thank you. Uh, we look forward to doing it again. And um, so, yeah, I have one more offer, a few more offerings. So if we could click to the next slide. Brian's there. Thanks, Brian. So if you'd like to go out for a hike, if, if this tour got you energized and you want to go get out on the property, John Muir Land Trust, as, as I told you earlier, has got some great properties to hike on. If you'd like a guided tour, you use our Visit Mobile app, which turns your cell phone into a guided tour. And it's like having a personal tour guide in your pocket, we say. And so we've got five tours on our properties. I highly recommend them. And you can visit our website to learn more about that. And also, next week, we have got a stargazing event. So join us with the Astronomical Society of the Pacific to gaze at the stars. And you can register at jmlt.org backslash twilight to experience that with us. We look forward to seeing you there. And Stephanie did a great job of asking questions of Métis and he answered many of them. But if you would like to, if you have additional questions, uh, we have Métis' email address. It's a little small, but it's mmana at lindsaywildlife.org. So there's um, the contact information for Métis and my contact information at John Muir Land Trust. And we just really appreciate that you've joined us here today. It's good to be in community from afar, and we'll be happy to see you out on the trails. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.